AM KMC family, grace and peace to you from our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. I first shared this message on the 13th of November with the leaders of the church, the LCC, the CGLs, the zone leaders, as well as the prayer leaders. On the lessons that we, as the church, we need to learn after going through close to two years of the pandemic. Now, because this sharing is the culmination of, you know, almost two years worth of reflection, it's not going to be short, and so I've broken this long message up into four smaller bite-sized portions. I don't know about you, but 2020, 2021 really passed by very quickly, not just so much in the flesh, but as a long winding tunnel with uh, pockets of light, you know, from time to time, but mostly dark and blur with the ever evolving COVID situation. By now, I think most of us, if not all of us, would have felt fatigue at one point or another. Now, the fact of the matter is that different crises come in different sizes. Some are huge, you know, and life-threatening, perhaps like the Delta variant of the COVID disease, while others are smaller in scale, but no less challenging. And I guess feeling disoriented, fatigued, are just some of uh, the possible consequences of a crisis. As you go through a crisis, that crisis can either challenge us or confuse us. It can either change us or crush us. So crisis can either cause us to dig deep or cause us to be destroyed. But if we don't want to waste a crisis, and we want to emerge from it stronger, we must be intentional to be able to step back and then reflect on three dimensions, from three dimensions. One, to recap. Second is to reset. And then third is to reorientate. So these three dimensions basically reflect the past, the present, and the future. If you've ever experienced a life-threatening crisis, you know, or watch enough shows, you will know that your entire life can easily flash before you in an instance when your life is in danger. You will quickly recall what happened in the past, you know, some recollections with fond memories, others with much regret. But recalling is not really the same as doing an intentional recap. Recalling is almost instinctive as a result of brain memory, reflex. Recap, however, especially recap with God, can be very powerful and life-changing. A good spiritual recap reminds us of where we came from and positions us to move forward into the destiny that God has prepared and called us towards. The entire book of Deuteronomy is a spiritual recap. If you read that book, you will find Moses repeating and recalling what took place earlier in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. In fact, the word Deuteronomy comes from two words, Deutero, which means second, and nomos, which means law. It's not that God has given a second law, but the laws of God are being repeated a second time. And so Moses was repeating history to reinforce the lessons of the past, how their forefathers have been rebellious up to that day, from the day they left Egypt, to the days they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because of their lack of faith in God. So incidentally, I'm 40 this year. Most of you know that half my life has passed, God willing, half more to go. And hopefully I am this place with a good balance of history as well as passion, the passion of the young people, but also the wisdom of the experience that comes from growing old. And so doing recaps, spiritual recaps are important, not just to give thanks to God, but also to trace the hands of an invisible God. Then there is also the reset. For instance, someone might have a major health scare, perhaps a triple bypass surgery or being diagnosed with cancer. And this crisis can easily cause one to re-examine their life priorities, bring about a reset. Perhaps maybe they didn't use to bother with exercising or dieting, but after a major health scare, suddenly they are very intentional to exercise three times a week. They eat less oily food. Or perhaps one might suddenly realize because of the crisis, they had neglected their family, all the relationships that they valued all this while. And because of the crisis, they have a reset of priorities. They choose to dial back from chasing money or work achievements to spend more time with their families, their elderly parents, you know, their children. So COVID really made us think, what exactly is the church all about? Why did God allow this crisis? What is God trying to do in refining His church? Is God trying to teach us that the church should rethink our worship service and fellowship? What are we really called to do as a church and to be as a church? What is this reset for? Think about your phones, you know, or your computers. When we press the reset button, it's because something went faulty. So what problems, what wrong attitudes, what wrong perspectives is God trying to correct? Finally, there is the reorientation. A new orientation can only emerge after one takes time to meaningfully step back, 
reflect and recap one's journeys uh, until the, the crisis hit, what was good, what wasn't good, what is God saying through it all. And so the crisis becomes a potential reset moment. But a reset moment may not necessarily turn out for the better if one simply returns to their old ways. Some people I know, for example, after a while, after the health scare, they were very diligent, you know, maintaining their daily walk and exercise, maintaining a good diet. But six months down the road, without a deep reorientation of values and challenging belief system, all these unhealthy old habits kick back in. And so a deep reorientation is necessary in order for new change, for growth to emerge. If after this whole pandemic, we simply go back to the way church has been before, you know, two years before, the way we've been operating in the past, then maybe we have wasted the entire two years. Having gone through close to two years of the pandemic, this is how we should process the three dimensions. <clears throat> there is no doubt <clears throat> COVID was a season where God has allowed the church to reset certain perspectives and practices. But unless, again, we are intentional to take time to recap, to look at where God is causing us to take a reset and to reorientate our fundamental beliefs, we would have wasted this crisis. And so with inputs from members of the LCC from our retreat, I will bring us through what has happened to us as a church in these two years. Um, some positives and some negatives. Are you ready? So let's start our recap. Our church team for this past two years was home with a heart. I'll begin by listing the positives and then comment on areas of growth along the way. So at the church-wide level, at the corporate level, the pulpit series, we cover the books of Romans and 1 Corinthians. Remember the theme verses, chapter 13, verse 8 in Romans is, no, Oh, no one, anything except to love each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. The initial three, four, three words, love never fails. Now, if you recall very quickly here, the Roman church had racial issues, Jews versus Gentiles, while the Corinthian church had pride issues, spiritually gifted versus those who were not. So both churches were divided. And Paul had to remind both churches of the great importance of loving one another deeply. The class meaning questions, while some may do see them as repetitive, they are really only guides for us to show and will help us to share how we are walking with the Lord and their tools for us to grow in Christ-likeness through mutual accountability. I said before that these questions are not cast in stone. The whole spirit of the class meeting really is to open ourselves genuinely and deeply to examine our souls fre frequently to make sure that no one, none of us ever take our salvation for granted. That's the whole point of the class meeting. As a church, as many of our cell groups have demonstrated, I've said before, I'm very proud of it, we have been very good in showing pastoral care to one another, especially in times of crisis. I've seen that happen so many times. But let's learn also to go further by showing love and care, by caring for each other's souls, right? Caring for the souls. That's the whole core purpose of the class meeting, watching over one another's souls in love. Then, at the church also, we house the homeless during the circuit breaker. And certainly, if you ask me, could we have done more? Sure, I think we should and we could have, but this requires fundamental mindset shifts. In case you're wondering why we stopped, it's because the kindergarten parents may be worried, may be concerned, and it's not just one set of leadership, but three sets of leadership who also must be comfortable. I know it's a matter of trust, a matter of education, and I met the homeless people personally several times. But when two parties, you know, the homeless and the parents, they're not going to meet and talk to each other. They're not going to interact with each other. This vacuum gap will unfortunately breed some kind of suspicion. You know, that's how basic human nature, human fear instincts work. And so, unfortunately, that's the reality we are struggling to deal with. And so I want to think that we as a church, therefore, should learn to see ourselves that we cannot simply rely on activities organized by the church. There are many times that the church's hands are tied. As in the case of housing the homeless, we had to stop when the kindergarten resumed operations. That we cannot gain access to, the church may not be able to go into certain places. And so as a church, we need to reframe our idea that church is both an organizational structure as well as individual components. You and me as individuals. There are things that you can do, which the church cannot do. There are things that the church can do, you cannot do. 
But we are not here to compete with each other. We are here to complement each other. So we are the church, but so are you. You are also the church. The next thing we did as a large body, the corporate body, we provided simple care packs to members on stay-home notice, quarantine orders, so and so forth. And that's one way I think we have demonstrated care and concern as a church in a very practical way. Two months ago, we even distributed care packs you know, to an entire Amokyo block made, who was made to undergo mandatory swabbing. And so my hope is that all of us will emulate and develop it further. Again, you don't have to wait for the church to do something, to organize something. My prayer indeed in this season of deep reset is that we will see a place for both the institutional church as well as the individual as part of the church. As an institu institution, we can do certain things, but as an individual and all of us who are led by the Lord, we have the potential and this potential for outreach is limitless. For example, a church member reached out to fellow mums doing home-based learning. That's great. I applaud that effort. It's something that the church wouldn't have been able to do. But the mum, you know, as a member, as an individual person, felt he wanted to be a home with a heart for fellow mums. Great. That's a commendable effort. So home with a heart theme is limited in its impact unless all of us as members begin to live it out wherever God has called us. Then as a church, we also pivoted to online worship service. We set up a temporary IT helpline to help seniors connect. When we first moved completely online during Circuit Breaker, I also had to remind all of us that church is not simply confined to a building. I encourage all of you to open up your homes to host each other, especially those who may be not so IT savvy, that you may continue to worship together. And so there the lesson was very simple. God's presence isn't confined only to the church building, to the church location. God's presence is wherever we gather as the people of God. And God's presence, God wants to be with us in our homes. And so the question for reflection is, can we learn to host God's presence well in our homes? Can we host God well in our homes? Or are we still compartmentalizing our lives? Are we only Christians on Sundays and not on other days? Are we Christians only when we come to church? Are we angels in church but monsters at home? I hope not. For if we as Christians, we lead a dual life, how then can we ever be good witnesses for our Lord Jesus Christ? I told our leaders back then that there are two non-negotiable principles we must understand. And with these two principles, I'll close this first part of the sharing. First is John Maxwell's Law of the Lead. John Maxwell's Law of the Lead. As a leader, we cannot lead others beyond the level we are at. If we are a level four leader, there's no way we can lead those under us, you know, to go to a level seven. The only way that can happen is we, we learn to expand our leadership capacity, to grow as leaders so that as we grow, the organization and the people under us will also grow along with us. And so, for example, a cell leader whose facilitation skill, level five, point 10, right? So the facilitation, will only be at level five. The members of the cell group are unlikely to exceed that, right? Unless the leader himself grows. And so in the same way, when it comes to facilitating a good class meeting, if the cell leader does not set the bar high to be vulnerable to open up, then there's a certain lid that will happen. Of course, God can remove the lid, but we must all be open and be willing to challenge the status quo. And so I want to challenge all of us, not just the leaders. We all need to learn to lift the lid above our own lives, to keep growing as Christians, as individuals. And that's how the church will grow as well. Second area as leaders and as Christians, I think we need to understand is integrity, a non-negotiable principle, integrity. Integrity is not just honesty, although it encompasses that dimension. Integrity comes from the root word integer, which means whole, a whole thing. Integrity then means we are always fully ourselves, regardless of the settings we are we find ourselves in. If we are a completely different person at home versus in church and at work, in child cell group or in private settings, that means we have compartmentalized. We are not whole, we are divided, and therefore that means we lack integrity. At the communion table, when the pastors we say Christ died to make us whole. It's not just about healing our brokenness, but really to restore our integrity as well. And so to summarize, 
This is perhaps the first and most important lesson from COVID. Worship is not to be confined only to church on Sundays. Worship includes and must include our homes and it must be daily. It means we are the church on Sunday, but so are you. You are the church every single day. And so the focus of this first part is a reflection on self. How are we in our daily walk with the Lord? I know we keep coming back to this question in our class meeting one, one way or another, but this is truly the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. John Wesley designed the class meeting as an accountability structure to make sure no one takes our salvation ever for granted. We all know how prone we are to slip backwards, and that's why we must diligently guard our hearts. That's the love that we ought to show one another, not just the pastoral care when someone is sick, you know, going through a crisis, coming around. That's good, excellent. Let's go one step more to learn to care for one another's souls. And the good works that we do, whether as individuals or as a church, really there are signs, overflowing signs of a redeemed heart. Not to earn us a better standing before God, but simply an overflowing expression that we are truly safe, that good works overflow from us. And so that's the first lesson from COVID.